Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us this morning or this afternoon, depending where you are located. My name is Elizabeth Leahy Madsen, and I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of PRB to this webinar to share our new Youth Family Planning Policy Scorecard. I'd like to thank our colleagues Emily Sullivan and David Aghoat and their organizations, FP2020 and the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition, for joining us to co-sponsor this webinar and as panelists. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to develop this scorecard. We're going to start today with some brief introductions to our three organizations, and in particular, focusing on the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalitions and FP2020's work on youth. Next, my colleague Meredith Pierce will provide an overview of the scorecard, including its intended purpose and methodology, and we'll share some of the scorecard results with you. We hope to reserve 25 or 30 minutes of our scheduled hour for discussion and questions, and we're very much looking forward to hearing your feedback and comments at that time. Some, house, some housekeeping notes, we do have several dozen people on the line, so we'd appreciate it if you would type in your questions and comments using the questions box feature of GoToWebinar. Um, that will help us prevent people unintentionally speaking over each other. And you can also type in questions and comments at any time throughout the webinar. As a reminder, you might find it helpful to either download the PDF of the scorecard from PRB's website using the link that was included in the webinar invitation. And if you're logged on through GoToWebinar, you should also see the scorecard uploaded and available to you in the handout section of the GoToWebinar interface, where we've also included the slides that we're using today. Some brief words about the Population Reference Bureau. PRB is a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., and we also have a regional office in Nairobi, Kenya. The core themes of our work include family planning and reproductive health, youth, gender, global health, and inequality and poverty, among others. You can see here our mission statement, which explains what we are all about. And that mission statement focuses on three key words inform, empower, and advance. Inform means that PRB analyzes complex data and research to provide the most objective, accurate, and up-to-date information in a format that is easily understood by advocates, journalists, and decision makers alike. Empower refers to our commitment to putting information into action. PRB builds coalitions and conducts workshops around the world to give our key audiences the tools that they need to understand and communicate effectively. And advance is where much of our work to support advocacy comes into play. Our goal is for policymakers to rely on sound evidence rather than anecdotal or outdated information when creating policies. With that, I'm going to turn it over to David from the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition. David. So welcome everybody. My name is uh, David Eckhart and I work for the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition. And we are basically the world's largest network of reproductive health organizations. Um, we were founded in 2004 with only 16 members and now up to, to the, uh, until today we have 410 members organizations including pharmaceutical companies, government or governments, uh, UN institutions, research centers, and civil society organizations. Our secretariat is based in Brussels, but we also have offices in Washington, D.C., Peru, and Dakar for our regional organizations. Um, next slide, please. Uh, oh, sorry, next one also again. Yes. So a lot of the work is done through our main engines, which are called implementing mechanisms. And we have three working groups, advocacy and accountability, system strengthening, and market development approaches. And then we have four caucuses that work um, on topics that are relevant to all of the three working groups, um, mainly generic manufacturers, new and underused reproductive health technologies, um, which is called NERD, unfortunately, um, maternal health supplies, and youth. 
And then we also have two regional fora, as I mentioned earlier, SECONAF in Francophone Africa, with the office in Dakar, and FOROLAC for the Latin America and Caribbean region, with its office in Peru. Um, next slide, please. So the Reproductive Health Youth Caucus was um, only founded in May 2017 as a formal organis uh, uh, implementing mechanism of the network. Um, and it was created to ensure that youth issues are included in the RHSC agenda on the long term and that the working group started to focus more on these issues. Um, today the, the group includes 150 representatives over from more than 76 organizations. Um, 38 of them are based in low-income countries. And because the, our coalition is mainly um, in coalition with experts and all the working groups are consist with experts, uh, all the young people in our group are also researchers, community workers, peer educators, advocates, program implementers, um, or they work for UN organizations. So it's, it's not like uh, it's a classic organ of youth participation. It's, we really want them to have a, a, an impact on, on the work we do and not just be a, a, an organ or a group where youth, young people can have their own voice. Um, there are, we have the, our coalition has an innovation fund for, for uh, projects and the, the Youth Caucus has now four projects that we manage. Um, one is on the distribution and the development of menstrual cups um, in Uganda. Um, a, another project we have now is Dundi, that is a, an app that offers information on contraceptives and points of delivery in um, Argentina. And we also have a webinar on Donde, I think, later this month or in the beginning of July, which is going to be very interesting. And we also have a project on guidelines for young people and long-acting reversible contraceptives or LARCs in China, together with uh, Mary Stokes International. And uh, our fourth and last project that we are managing right now is uh, the training of pharmacists on youth-friendly services because um, we believe that there is a, a bit of a, a problem with over-the-counter access to uh, contraceptives, which is easy and, 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 and cheap for, for young people, but sometimes there is a problem with the information about the product, so that project tries to focus on, on, on those issues. So um, I think that is a brief introduction of what we do. And I now turn the words over to Emily Sullivan. Thank you very much, David. I'm very excited to be with you all today. I'm calling in from Washington, DC, where Family Planning 2020's Secretariat is located. As I said, my name is Emily, and I'm the Youth Engagement Manager for Family Planning 2020. And before we move into the main portion and most exciting part of this webinar, I want to briefly provide you with some information about FP2020 and explain why today's webinar fits into our work. FP2020 was launched in 2012 as a global partnership that supports the right of women and girls to decide freely and for themselves whether, when, and how many children they want to have. And now when I say global partnership, that includes you, the young leaders, and the youth allies. FP2020 aims to enable 120 million more women and girls to use contraceptives in 69 countries by the year 2020. However, it is not about the numbers, it's about how we get there. We have to work together to ensure that our work is rights-based, and this includes securing young people's rights to contraceptives. Next slide, please. To date, 38 countries of FP2020's 69 focus countries have made a commitment. They are listed here. These commitments consist of measurable, financial, political, programmatic pledges related to family planning. These commitments and self-reports 
from Ministries of Health explaining how they are working to fulfill their commitments can be found on our website. You can find these documents and more by visiting our country pages at uh, country pages, which is this link at the top of the screen here, or you can simply click on the countries tab at the top of our main web page. If a country has made a commitment, one of those listed here, they also have three to four FP 2020 focal points. These are not um, FP, 20 and 20, FP 2020 employees, but rather they are individuals who typically work as the directors of family planning, reproductive health, or maternal health within the Ministry of Health, UNFPA, USAID, DFID, and a civil society organization. Currently, I'm working to link young people to these focal points in country. If you do not see your country listed here, either you're from an FP 2020 country, but your country has not made a commitment, or due to development index definitions, your country is not categorized as a low-income country. Of course, this does not mean that there are not challenges or important, important work to be done in your country. Next slide, please. So why are we co-hosting this webinar today? We are doing this because we recognize that reaching young people is essential to reading the FP 2020 goal on the way to reaching the Sustainable Development Goals in 2030. Specifically, FP 2020 is working to improve the capability of young people, advocates, and decision makers to use data and evidence to inform decision making. We are also encouraging and supporting partnerships with young people within the FP 2020 community. Today's webinar tackles both of these areas, and therefore, we should get to it. Please take it away, Meredith. Thanks, Emily. Um, so my name is Meredith Pierce, and I'm a policy analyst at PRB. I will be giving you all a brief overview of the scorecard now, including the purpose, methodology, and results. The scorecard was created to give donors, governments, and advocates a snapshot of the current environment for youth FP policies. The scorecard examines which evidence-based policies currently exist within each country, and it allows readers to compare policy environments across countries. We hope that the policy gaps or areas of weakness identified by the scorecard will be used to inform future policy priorities and advocacy efforts. To start, we reviewed 42 studies and systematic reviews on youth SRH from low or middle income countries. From this evidence base, we identified legal approaches and programmatic interventions that either remove a barrier to or result in increased contraceptive use among youth ages 15 to 24. When selecting indicators, we chose those with supporting evidence directly linked to increased contraceptive use. So this meant that some related indicators weren't included. For example, those that result in increases in youth knowledge about FP, but not in increases in FP use. We shared two draft sets of indicators with youth SRH experts, then we revised the framework based on their feedback, and we ultimately selected six indicators that fit the selection criteria, which are shown here on this slide. The first three indicators shown on the left represent barriers to contraceptive use. These are parental and spousal consent and provider discretion, also referred to collectively as external authorization, restrictions based on age, and restrictions based on marital status. So in considering these three indicators, we were looking for both policy language that restricts access for youth, as well as affirmative language that guarantees adolescents independent access to contraception. For restrictions based on age, we took into consideration whether a full range of methods were made available to youth regardless of age, or whether there were restrictions in place for some or all of the methods based on age. The next three indicators on the right represent programmatic interventions that have been shown to increase access to contraception. 
The first is comprehensive sexuality education. For this, we use UNFPA's Operational Guidance for Comprehensive Sexuality Education as a framework to assess this indicator. We consider the nine essential components included in their guidance, which have a strong focus on human rights and gender, as the gold standard for what a sexuality education program should or could include. The next indicator is youth-friendly service provision. We used seven core elements identified in the High Impact Practices in Family P Planning HIPS brief on adolescent-friendly contraceptive services as a framework for this indicator. Finally, the Community Support Indicator focuses on efforts to build support for youth FP within the communities that influence their ability to access services. Often this includes activities targeting adult gatekeepers, such as parents and religious leaders. Since the evidence is still emerging on which community engagement initiatives are most effective in promoting contraceptive use among youth, the scorecard uses a broad approach to categorizing policy commitments in this area. So in considering these last three indicators, we were looking at the extent to which policies outlined specific plans for these programs. We devised three color-coded categories to classify how well a country is performing for each indicator. For each indicator, the color assigned is based on the extent to which a country provides the most favorable policy environment for youth to access and use contraception. Note that the red category was used both for policies that impede access and for lack of a policy. Each indicator has a more specific definition for how we categorize the country's policy environment for that indicator. The example that's shown here is for the indicator restrictions based on marital status. We also created an internal rubric to capture in detail the exact language that we were looking for in order for a country to be classified into the green category so that we could maintain consistency in application across countries. The scorecard evaluates existing official government documents that impact youth FP. These include the legal framework, such as constitutions, laws, reproductive health acts, and programmatic guidelines, such as FP-costed implementation plans, adolescent health strategies, and youth development plans. We reviewed every relevant document we could locate online and we contacted multiple government and non-government stakeholders in each country to ensure that relevant policies were not inadvertently omitted and to validate our analysis of the policies. So here is an example of the policies that we reviewed in Guinea. In total, we reviewed over 150 policy documents across 16 countries. The next section will share what we found for the countries included in the scorecard. As mentioned, the scorecard currently includes 16 countries. All are in Sub-Saharan Africa except for the Sindh region in Pakistan. This table shows the findings for the 16 countries across six indicators. If you're following along in the PDF of the scorecard, you can find this table on page 17. So as a reminder, a green score reflects that the country has the most favorable policy environment for that indicator. Yellow signifies a promising policy environment, but with room for improvement. And red signifies a policy environment that inhibits youth access to and use of FP or no policy at all for that indicator. In this table, we used NP to denote the difference between a red categorization for lack of a policy versus a policy that impeded access. So the findings provide a high-level picture of which countries have the most favorable environments for youth FP, such as Tanzania, which is shown here and has a strong policy environment in five out of the six indicators. 
and it tells us overall which countries have the least favorable or most restrictive policy environments. Within each country section of the scorecard PDF, you can read a detailed explanation for why each indicator was categorized as it was, including specific quotations from specific policy documents. The scorecard also allows you to compare across countries in one indicator, such as marital status restrictions shown here. So this shows us that nine out of the 16 countries have a law or policy that supports youth access to FP services regardless of their marital status. In the scorecard, you'll find a discussion of results section in which we describe some of the trends that we noticed in our findings. Overall, results are most promising for the youth-friendly FP service provision and community support indicators. These two indicators had the fewest countries classified in the red category. So for example, 15 countries include at least some of the components of youth-friendly FP services and therefore fell into the green and yellow categories. 11 countries outlined detailed steps to build community support for youth FP, placing them in the green category. We found results are fairly mixed for the indicators on restrictions based on age and on marital status with a fair share of countries falling into the green, yellow, and red categories. For external authorization, only two countries, Benin and Tanzania, received a green categorization. This is because this is a multi-component indicator that covers parental and spousal consent and provider discretion. So frequently, countries prohibit one or two, but not all three of these forms of external authorization. Only one country, Cote d'Ivoire, received a green category for a comprehensive sexuality education. This is likely due to the fact that the UNFPA framework that we selected set a high bar, it's the gold standard and due to the fact that we did have difficulty locating specific guidelines for sexuality education or for family life education. Some HIV education programs that we reviewed included very little mention of contraception. Although we did not include an indicator for youth engagement, we noted in our discussion that many countries had specific objectives or activities to engage youth directly in the design, planning, and implementation of youth-friendly health services, and often SRH services specifically. Finally, we noted in our discussion that countries frequently identified gender inequalities and gender norms as challenges for youth, particularly girls and young women who wish to access contraception. And policies promote various approaches to address gender as part of the enabling environment for youth access to FP. We consider gender as a component of two of the six indicators, the indicators for youth-friendly services and CSE, rather than a standalone indicator. Finally, our scorecard did have limitations. Most importantly, this document does not capture how well these policies are being implemented. It only considers whether or not a government has committed to the beneficial intervention on paper. Also, the scorecard will need to be updated as the policy environment changes in order for it to stay relevant. For example, we recently reviewed the draft of a reproductive health law that is expected to be passed in Cote d'Ivoire in the next year, and we found that it includes language that requires youth under age 16 to obtain consent from a legal representative to access contraception. If this passes in its current form, then we would need to update the scorecard to reflect that. Looking ahead, we are in the process of securing future funding to build upon the scorecard. We plan to create a digital version of the scorecard as opposed to its current PDF format 
so that readers can easily click through and search between countries and indicators. We also hope to host the policy documents themselves on our website so that they can be available to advocates, particularly those youth advocates in country who have given us feedback that they often have trouble locating these policy documents. We will also be refining and updating the scorecard as we receive feedback and additional policy documents. The next phase of our work will also include in-country policy implementation assessments for some of the countries included in the scorecard. I hope that this has been a quick and informative uh, overview of the scorecard. If you have any questions about the methodology or the results, please keep those in mind for the upcoming Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Meredith and Emily and David, um, for all of your presentations. And thanks to all of, all of the participants on the line for your attention. We'd like to open it up now for a discussion and to answer any questions that you may have about the scorecard. If time allows, we have some specific questions about how you might see it informing your own work or how it could be improved. But first, I'd like to start with any clarification questions that people may have about the scorecard itself. You can ask your question in one of two ways. You can either use the raise hand feature, and we will unmute your line individually and call on you by name to ask your question. Or if you prefer, you can type your question in to the questions box, and we will read it aloud uh, to the group and then answer it. So let's see how we can. The first question that we have is coming in um, in the questions box. And the participant is asking if we could clarify and repeat the findings based on external authorization and marital status. I don't fully understand that question. Would you like us to go through that slide again? Yes, please. OK. So we'll go back to the slide on um, external authorization for marital status. I think that was the example. Um, so we found that for marital status, the results were actually fairly mixed. So I'm going to go back to the overall results. So when you look at this table, marital status restrictions are the third column. Um, so the point that we made was just that there are quite a few countries that fall into all of the categories. And then I think the other part of the question was if we could go over the external authorization indicator results. This is the first column in this table. And what we noted was that only two of the countries received a green categorization. And the reason why it's difficult to achieve a green categorization for external authorization is because it includes three forms of external authorization. So the policy environment needed to um, restrict all three forms of external authorization from being required in order to receive a green. So many received a yellow categorization because they addressed one or two, but not all three. Great. Um, and again, if you have any further follow-ups, please feel free to type them in and we'll address them. But I'm going to move on to another question right now. Uh, someone asks if um, we could explain how we include and reflect the results of subnational policies. So we actually exclude um, subnational policies. So for this exercise, we only looked at national policies. Um, we do recognize, and I believe it's included in our limitations section, that as countries are increasingly decentralizing, um, the national policies don't necessarily represent the local policies. So for one, one country in Pakistan, we did only look at the region of Sindh. So we didn't include the national policies. We just um, looked at the regional policies. Um, so to look at subnational policies, I think that that would be a different exercise. Great. And we have another question uh, specifically about the indicator on youth-friendly services. 
if a policy mentioned youth-friendly services but did not include any of the high-impact practices, how was it coded? I can't think of any example where a country mentioned youth-friendly services without at least mentioning one of the components of youth-friendly services. So most of those countries would have, were, would have fallen into the yellow category. If they just mentioned the phrase youth-friendly services without any detail, I think that that would be read, but we just didn't experience that situation. So if we did, we would want to update our internal rubric to decide where we would place that country. At this point, we don't have any other questions entered in to the question feature, um, nor any hands raised. Here comes another one. Oh, it's incomplete. <laughs> So I'm, oh, sorry, a question, could you please tell us the seven high-impact youth-friendly service measures? Yes. So you'll see that in the scorecard methodology section, we describe each of the indicator definitions in detail. Um, we explain how we composed the indicator and how we ranked each country in the green, yellow, and red categorizations for each indicator. For youth-friendly service provision, the, the seven elements that we pulled from the High Impact Practices Brief on Adolescent-Friendly Services are, number one, train and support providers to offer adolescent-friendly contraceptive services. Number two, enforce confidentiality and audiovisual privacy. Number three, offer a wide range of contraception. Number four, provide no cost or subsidized services. And the next three are related more to the enabling environment. That is number five, build an enabling legal and political environment. Number six, link service delivery with activities that build support in communities. And number seven, address gender and social norms. And again, you can see these on page 12 of the scorecard PDF. And we also, during the course of the webinar, uploaded the HIPS brief on adolescent-friendly contraceptive services, as well as the UNSPA operational guidance on CSE into the handout section. So if you're interested in reading more about either of the criteria for those indicators, you can find those documents right in the GoToWebinar interface. So we have a couple more um, questions that have come in, but we also have someone who's raised their hand. And so I'd like to um, call on Allie Duty. Allie, we're going to unmute your line um, so that you can ask your question directly. Okay. okay. Your line should be unmuted. I think so. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, so, hi, this is Allie Duty from PAI. Thanks so much for doing this webinar and sharing this information. I think um, to have it all in one place and really see it compared across countries and um, learn more about the different indicators that you use is tremendously helpful. So, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for that. You know, one of the things that I know we all see um, across the board in terms of SRHR um, or a lot of times there are good policies written or, you know, semi-good policies written, um, but they we see a problem when it comes to implementation. And just wondering if you looked at all in terms of implementation or if that wasn't, if, if it wasn't part of your research, if that came up at all um, as an issue. When there was a policy in place, was it being implemented? Thanks. Right, so we did not look at implementation. So this scorecard, I think, is kind of the first step in what would need to happen to really see what's going on in country. So this tool just shows what is down on paper. And so it can be used in country to hold uh, policymakers accountable to what they've committed to. But it would require um, a knowledge of what's actually going on and which things are being implemented in country. So we were hoping to, in the next phase of our work on this, um, 
use this tool and what we've learned about what's down on paper to assess um, in country what's going on for a few of the, the countries that we've included in the scorecard and compare their commitments on paper to um, what's going on in the country. And just to second what Meredith said, um, and I see we've actually had at least one other question come in on the line about implementation. We definitely recognize that examining the policy environment is only the first step, and that, of course, implementation of these policies is what ultimately tells us the truth about youth well-being and um, access to services. So we look forward to the opportunity to hopefully assess implementation of some of these indicators in a few countries. It's obviously a much bigger task than just reviewing the policy environment. But we hope that the assessment of the policy environment will be helpful for advocates because at, at a minimum they can go to leaders and to policymakers and say, this is what we need to correct first from what's on paper or we already have these great commitments in place. Let's see how well they are being implemented on the ground. We have several more uh, types and of questions. Can, that, please, please, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so if I can add something to that. Um, when we look at youth policy, we often hear the question from organizations or networks, why do we need an extra special focus on young people? Like, why is the situation of young people so different from older age groups? And then it's really useful to have evidence-based tools and information to provide the, to show that the situation for young people is often more crucial and requires an extra effort or an extra investment to to create or to close the gap between young people and and, and, and all and older age groups so that is why tools like these are really useful for advocacy work uh, on the ground great thank, thank you David thank you. Um, we have a we have a couple questions that have come in about the number of countries that were included and do we plan to include any more <laughs> and just confirming that the results are only available for these 16 countries, which do include um, all nine of the Ouagadougou Partnership countries in West Africa as well as several other countries where a lot of um, priority action and advocacy is happening around youth family planning. This um, project took place over the course of about nine to twelve months and um, so the resources that we had enabled us to complete the exercise for these 16 countries and at this point we do plan to keep the results updated for these countries which is an important task in and of itself because policy environments are always evolving and we want to be sure to reflect um, the successes of, of future advocacy efforts to improve these policy environments. We don't have any discrete plans at this point to add new countries to this analysis, but we will be keeping it up to date for these countries. I'm going to read a couple other questions that have come in. Um, somebody asks, if we, in order to score them, for example, for the youth-friendly services, did we value all components the same, or did we create a formula to sort of weight different components within each indicator? So that's a really good question. For the youth-friendly services indicator, we, um, we did rank them equally, ex the seven components, um, with the exception of providing a full range of methods. So um, this is, is explained better in the text of the PDF, but a country could not achieve a green category for youth-friendly services if they mentioned everything but didn't offer a full range of methods. For the Comprehensive Sexuality Education Program, which is composed of an uh, indicator, which is composed of nine components, those were all weighted equally. And they had to mention all nine of them to achieve the green category which is one of the reasons why only one country achieved the green category for that indicator. We have a, a question um, from Tanzania, but I think the question applies to other countries as well. How did the study get information on marital status restrictions, since we know that male involvement is still low and that women often have to conceal their use of family planning? So when we were looking at marital status restrictions, we were looking at um, specific language that guaranteed access regardless of marital status to achieve the green category. 
or to achieve a yellow category if it supported access for unmarried women but didn't specify that specifically that this also included youth. And then when countries received a red categorization, it was because they specifically said that they had, they had placed a restriction on women accessing um, contraception without, uh, if they were unmarried. We have two other people who've raised their hands, um, and so I'm going to turn it over to them one at a time. So the first person who has raised their hand is Betiana Casares. Um, Betiana, we have unmuted your line, so you can ask your question. Hello. I'm from Argentina, and I want to ask a question regarding to the Latin American and Caribbean region. You talked before about the intention of extend the, the, the use of the scorecard to other country, but uh, I want to know if you have any plan maybe in the future to work with organizations from this region or if you know that uh, maybe another network or organization are interested to to use the scorecard for this region. I think it is a, a very good tool to compare the situation among different countries uh, and to use uh, that kind of information to advocate and also to develop a South-South cooperation strategy. So congratu congratulations. And my, my question is focused on the possibilities to use in the, this region. Uh, thank you, Betiana. This is Liz. I'm, I'm afraid I have to repeat <laughs> what I said earlier, which is, unfortunately, um, the project that developed the scorecard is completed, and so at this point, we don't have any plans to expand it to additional countries beyond the 16 that are included, but I'm really happy to hear um, your enthusiasm and the possibilities that you see for a tool like this in the Latin American Caribbean region. We um, would always be happy to work with partners who are interested in replicating this type of analysis in their own countries um, to provide additional information about our methodology and things that we learned through along the way so that if others are interested in undertaking something similar in countries that are not currently included, um, we're happy to provide some, some thoughts and sort of um, assistance if you'd like to undertake the exercise in your own country. The next person um, whose hand is raised is um, Melissa Garcia. So Melissa, um, just a moment. Having trouble unmuting your line. OK, Melissa, your line is unmuted now. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, everyone. Um, just want to say good morning and good afternoon. Thank you so much, um, and congratulations on this work. It's very exciting. So um, I'm with the International Consortium for Emergency Contraception um, as part of MSH. And um, so we, look, we work really specifically on emergency contraception and have been looking at these kind, you know, these policies, these kinds of documents from the perspective of EC access. And um, it's not always easy to find these policies, so really want to recognize uh, the great effort on that front. And often uh, in country when we're doing advocacy and asking questions about EC access, you know, and all the related um, indicators that you discussed, right, like external authorization and marital status, age and the like, uh, often people guess what the policies themselves say. So perception comes into play a lot with these issues, as well as implementation and everything else. So I just want to signal that, like, you know, establishing the baseline for what these documents themselves say is really, really important. And then we also have to come into um, and address questions like, what do people think they say? Because often that is a strong currency in countries, particularly, you know, from our perspective where we work on access to emergency contraception, including for unmarried women, including for adolescents and the like. Um, I guess just want to signal that uh, we have been doing, we just uh, sent out a survey on access to EC um, among youth, you know, so looking at some of these policies and we'll be using this um, this work uh, to sort of corroborate what, what we've been learning in those countries and, um, you know, trying to figure out 
we've been asking similar questions like marital status, prescription status, um, age restrictions, and what do people think the barriers are? So we're incorporating that that sense of you know perceptions of what policies say. So I guess just some feedback about thinking you know if there's going to be next steps in, involved, thinking about how to incorporate and address that issue of you know perception of what policies say, and um, also to just you know say we're we're actually going to hope to send out our survey again, and uh, we'll definitely be sharing our results with this community. Thanks so much. Great, thank you very much, Melissa. Um, and we certainly agree that knowledge of the policies and perception of them plays a huge role in the effect that they have on service delivery and really excited to hear about the work that you're doing. Um, we have a couple other questions that have come in through the question box. We have two questions about dissemination of the scorecard. Um, one sort of general question, do we have advocacy strategies or specific target audiences in mind to help advocates use the scorecard and widen its dissemination? And then we have a, a more specific question. Will you be presenting the scorecard at the Family Planning Summit next month in London? It might be good that governments know that there's this tool that exists to track them. Um, so I want to be sure to give Emily Sullivan the chance to um, share a little bit of information about this summit in particular and how resources like this might come into play. Sorry about that. I was muted. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity, Liz. Um, as many of you know, the London Summit of Family Plan on Family Planning um, is going to be happening in uh, you know, early or mid-July, July 11th, and there will be opportunities to highlight different pieces of work in a variety of sessions. Um, some people have submitted ideas for such sessions, and I am actually unfamiliar if PRB um, has been a part of that process, actually, so Liz and I can talk, but um, I think that there's a great opportunity to be featuring um, this scorecard um, at a variety of, in a variety of ways, both around the summit, but also in following the summit, um, FP 2020 will be launching a microsite, which will be able to feature different um, resources like this one. And we will be working with our focal points, who one of which um, is always within the Ministry of Health in country in each of the 38 countries. So we will work to make sure that the government um, representatives are aware of the scorecard. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, we only have one more question in the question box, so I think we'll answer that, and then I will turn it over. We actually have some questions for all of you, for the participants, um, some sort of discussion questions for our last nine or ten minutes. So let me first answer the question that was typed in. Um, somebody asked, did it ever occur in a country that policies or laws were different at a national level than the subnational level? Did you only work with national levels? And the answer to your second question is yes. In 15 of the 16 countries, we only looked at national level policies. Um, certainly, our task would have been compounded if we were to cover all subnational policies as well. But we do recognize how important those are in shaping service delivery, and, and also that there's a need to sort of check whether national and subnational policies align or contradict with each other. In Pakistan, we did the opposite. We did not look at the national level policies, but we looked exclusively at the policy environment in the Sindh province. Um, I think with that, we will turn it over to the discussion questions. And if folks have other questions about the scorecard itself, please feel free to keep typing them in. But we'd love to hear your thoughts on some of these questions that you can see here. Why do you think it's important for youth advocates to understand the youth's FP policy environment in their countries? Uh, how can evidence on youth policies help inform your advocacy work? Do you think that it can? Um, and if you have any thoughts on how this scorecard, either alone or in combination with other tools, might be useful to your work, and again, your work in general or specific upcoming advocacy opportunities that you'd like to highlight. So um, we will take questions again, or I'm sorry, responses and thoughts on these questions either typed into the question box, or this might also be a really good opportunity um, to raise your hand using that feature, and we will call on you.
We did have, uh, oh, somebody has raised their hand, Patrick. Okay, Patrick, um, I have unmuted your line, Patrick. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Patrick and I'm, uh, I'm calling in from Uganda. Good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, so two things. One, I, I really want to commend the team for this uh, great resource and, uh, because, um, you know, it's helpful because, you know, it, uh, as youth advocates, we, we've been in, in most of our countries, you find we, we, we always struggle to get such uh, resources that really inform our advocacy and especially especially some of us who come from countries where you note know that like the teenage pregnancy rates are high, adults infertility rates are really, really high. So I, I really wanted to commend the team. And such, uh, just to answer question one, if, uh, why, why, why I find such, uh, why I find it important to really support young youth advocates to understand the FP policy environment is mainly because their policy, their commitments that are, that are, government makes, uh, various governments make in, in, in relation to, you know, uh, increasing access to uh, family planning services and, I mean, like Uganda, for example, is a FP2020 uh, committing country. And But in most cases, when we have evidence like this, uh, when we have uh, more information in regard to the policy environment like this, it helps us to really uh, follow up in terms of accountability, you know, in terms of our uh, uh, budget advocacy to be able to 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 you know advocate for resources to be aligned more to uh, interventions that can increase access to uh, family planning services for young people. I'm glad the survey the, the squawk had really highlighted out a couple of issues, and uh, I've been strictly interested in data for Uganda, which I'm very sure is going to be helpful in our work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, uh, for weighing in and for joining us in your evening. We have a few other hands that are raised, so I am going to open the line um, for Betty. Betty Hanun, your line is open. Hi, can you hear me? This is Betty yes, Hanun can. with Merck for Mothers. Um, thank you very much for the for the seminar and all the information. And I think the um, information in the scorecard could be very useful, not only for advocacy, but for looking at um, where to focus programming in specific areas. And in addition to the overall scorecard, the details behind the scorecard um, and, and some of your reference documents could be a great way to start to, as we begin or enhance our journey around family planning for youth. So understanding where we can have an impact and focus in terms of youth-friendly services. You know, so if we, if we understand in a particular country we're interested in which of the seven high impact practices were strong and which ones were weaker, we can see where we, we need to focus. Exactly. I'm really um, happy to hear you say that because that is a, certainly a top goal of, a, of ours with the creation of the scorecard is to help sort of prioritize um, areas of policy weakness where advocates can uh, channel their efforts. We have another hand raised. I am going to open the line for you, Anya. Anya Peterson. Yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Um, yeah, my name is Anya. I work as the coordinator for the YSAFE network, which is the youth network of IPPFEN. So um, the context that I work in is a little bit different because we work with youth in Europe and Central Asia. But I found the, it was a really, really interesting webinar and I found the scorecard super interesting because what we and our partners have been working with a little bit is trying to gather information from young people on the perception of access to contraception in their countries. And the scorecard could really supplement this in an interesting way if it could be used in the, our context as well to see how what what are what are the real gaps in, in policy or legislation and then also holding it up against the perception of young people of their access to youth friendly services to see where we need to work really on information and where we really need to work on advocacy on legislation um, with decision makers. Wonderful. Thank you, Anya. Um, I'm looking to see if we have any other hands that have raised uh, just as we're coming up against the end of our webinar. And I'm not seeing any, so I want to give the opportunity to our three panelists, Emily, David, and Meredith. 
um, to add any final thoughts or concluding comments that you may have before we wrap up. Thank you very much, Liz. This is Emily speaking. Um, I would just like to thank um, all of those who joined today and to encourage us all um, on the implementation piece. I do recognize that this is more difficult than we think um, or more difficult um, to assess than necessarily the policies themselves, although it is quite a feat to find them. But I would like to encourage us to think about how we can um, work with young people to assess the implementation. We know that there's a lot of really strong um, youth-led organizations and networks in each of these countries, and there may be an opportunity to really work with work work, work with them to assess the implementation from their perspective on um, what does uh, youth access to contraception in their communities feel like on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. And yes, I just want to say thank you again to everybody and especially to everybody who was listening. And I just wanted to add that um, to get more information about the perspective of young people, we have been doing some uh, consultations with young people in um, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Uganda and Bali. And, and the information that comes out of there was really surprising and really informative. And when we can put this next to the, the scoreboard, this will give us a better view of the gaps between perception and um, the policies at hand. So this will be a very useful tool for us to get our advocacy going and get those in the, in analysis going with young people. So thank you again. And this is Meredith, and I've just put up my email on the last slide here. Um, I wanted to encourage everyone as you're reading through the scorecard in more detail or thinking of other questions that maybe didn't get answered, um, just to email me and we would love to keep the conversation going. And we'd love to have your feedback um, for those that are working in country. If you have any questions about the analysis for your country um, or any information about upcoming policies that you'd like to share to make sure we keep our scorecard up to date, we would love that. And I also wanted to note that we're hoping to do the same webinar in French in the near future for our Francophone colleagues. So if you have, um, if you have Francophone colleagues that um, you know of, we will hopefully share that information through the same networks and, and do this again. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everyone. We really appreciate your joining us and your participation. And as Meredith said, please keep your comments and suggestions and feedback coming. And uh, wishing everyone a good rest of their day.